Hey everyone. So we're up to number six of seven in our series on capabilities for new era leaders. We're up to active reflection this week. So active reflection is, is just such a critical part of what we do. Um, this whole idea of transformation is so much about reflection as leaders and our ability to transform ourselves so that we can transform the world around us. Active reflection is really, really critical. So um, I think it's also one of the easiest things to, like it's the first thing that goes when we're under pressure, when we've got, you know, a whole bunch of big stuff happening. We've got the very real pressures of our organization around us. That space for journaling, gratitude journal, mindfulness practice, you know, going to the gym, just zoning out and, and kind of thinking your thoughts and daydreaming. It's often the first thing that goes out the window. And yet creating that space is so important so that we've got that ability to digest and process what's going on and for the important stuff to kind of bubble up. I hesitate to use the term the subconscious, but you know I think we really truly need to bring all of ourselves to this effort. And um, and and there's an element of um, of knowing and instinct that goes along with this. And if we're in that constant mode of survival and the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, and we're we're constantly at pace and we never have that space to rest and digest, then we are not operating at our full potential because we're not bringing all of that, including our reflection time, to the task. So active reflection is critical. Um, it's one of the th first things that goes out the window whenever we're under pressure. But we've got to keep that eye on the prize in terms of continually, continually cultivating this in ourselves because the more work that we can, we can do in ourselves, the better that we're going to show up for the task of transforming our organisation. Um, and I think, you know, there's... We don't talk a lot about instinct in this game. Um, I have a book on my bookshelf called The Attacker's Advantage by Ram Sharan. And honestly, the entire book is about intuition. That, but, but he never mentions the word because intuition is a dirty word in business. It's a dirty word in our context. And so you know, I think we miss out on so much of even just starting from a place of acknowledgement that sometimes there is a knowing that comes from whether you want to rationalize it as the subconscious processing of the, the data feed that you're getting through your senses on a day-to-day -day basis or um, whether you're comfortable with, uh, I guess, a, a less rational explanation for it and, and talking about gut feel. It's a, that, that sense of intuition has become a dirty word. And, and I get it because we want to be making decisions based on data and evidence and we want to be reinforcing those feedback loops so that as we make choices we can see the impact of the choices that we're making and we have the best chance to understand our context and how our actions influence that context so I'm not disputing any of that uh, but there is absolutely a place for gut feel and and that reframe that comes from a deeper sense of knowing that we don't necessarily give respect or recognition to in our business day to day. So um, I want to go back to, we talked about Krishnamurti's work when we are talking about courage and fear, but he has this beautiful concept which I think applies here too around non-accumulative seeing. And so this idea of rather than a data-driven approach where we accumulate knowledge, what does it look like? In that sense of non-accumulative seeing. So in our organizations we're great at accumulating process, accumulating data, adding on constantly. And we're really really not good at removing process, putting down luggage. These are not skills that we actively work on in our business and so why should we be surprised if within ourselves we have trouble putting down our baggage? putting down our luggage. It's it's the type of stuff that if we allow it to accumulate over time, it becomes sickness, ill health, you know, all of those things, chronic fatigue. And so that process of active reflection is actually about getting some visibility into that, seeing some of that, working out what to do with it, sitting with it in a way that we can start to put some of that luggage down. 
and we can start to let some of that go and create more space for what needs to come through. Um, and in doing that, I think we start to learn a lot more about that frame that we operate in and the boundaries that we have um, around us. And active reflection helps us to look at our own patterns, see different perspectives, start to evolve our, um, our way of being in the world. So whether it's mindfulness, as I said, going to the gym for me, ultra running, like hit the trails, really meditative experience when you're just, just going, um, you know, whatever, whatever that is for you, creating that space of a moment for reflection is really, really important. Um, and I think there's anti-patterns that show up in business, right? And you'll see these all around you. I think they're really, really prevalent. So the first is um, that idea of valuing rational data and analysis to the exclusion of all else. So not that valuing those things is not important, but that when we get to the point of valuing them and completely excluding a sense of deeper knowing, then and, and, and those answers that maybe come to us in a less well-articulated format, that's the anti-pattern we want to avoid. One of the antidotes to that is to, when we're making decisions, make sure that we have those feedback loops in place so that we can learn from those decisions that we make so that then it becomes just a little bit less about the data that we're acting on for the decision and more about the feedback that comes back as a result of that to influence our next decision, right? It takes the pressure off a little bit. Uh, and I think the other anti-pattern is this, is using that, um, let's call it qualitative data, that gut feel data, interchangeably with quantitative data. Because these two things are, are different and we need to um, respect that they are different levels of information in our data gathering process and so they need to be treated differently they're not interchangeable there's absolutely a place for hard and fast data on conversion rates on websites or you know time taken for a particular activity like there's absolutely a place for that quantitative data and there is equally i believe a place for that information that comes from non-accumulative seeing that that information that comes from a place of reflection and maybe it, it kind of crops up in, um, in some of the work that we're doing in an unexpected or a less articulated way. Um, I'm conscious that I'm being really vague, so I'll try and give you an example. Um, one of my favorite meditations that uh, was taught to me by uh, one of my early teachers and, and a meditation that I still teach on retreat is um, three questions. And so the idea is that this is something that you would practice recurrently over over a number of days weeks months um, I actually took this path myself for probably a six to nine month period um, not every day but most weeks um, went through this little I guess meditation or, or passage of inquiry and so the three questions are who am I what do I want what is my purpose you ask each of these questions and allow time for whatever needs to come up to come up in between. You allow that to run for a period of time and then ask the second question and then the third. And so it's this really nice little place of we have some stability and some consistency around the reflection questions that we're asking. There, there's a pattern and a rhythm to that. There is space for whatever to come up to come up. Um, and, and there's that repetition so it starts to change over time. So that's what I talk about when I'm talking about these places for active reflection and that non-accumulative um, seeing. I didn't, in between those meditations, I'm not going out and actively doing work on my purpose or what I want, or you know, I'm not, and then incorporating that into a meditation, right? It's, 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 not, it's not what's going on, but I'm having a series of experiences and a series of learnings that go on, and then that will flavor what comes up in the next time that I that I sit quietly with those three questions. But it's this idea of a, a slightly more, there's an active space for reflection, but maybe a more passive way for some of that data to show up. And then what do I do with that data, right? So now that I've got this thing, what do I do with it? Well, that's where we, we start to incorporate in for those feedback loops. So 
um, whilst we are probably not going to come to an answer as to whether or not the button on the web page needs to be green or blue through meditation, um, we might, but whilst we're probably not going to that level of detail, you know, there might be other things that are coming up around um, some of that processing of maybe how you're working with a particular individual or a, or a leader, um, you know, maybe some shift in mindset or perspective that needs to go on, and you can take what you're learning from that active reflection space, start to incorporate that into what you're doing, and then watch for the change in behavior or the change in impact that you're having. So active reflection is really, really critical. And no matter what method you use, the, the critical bit here is that we're giving ourselves that space and that time. For me, I have yoga, I have my work with horses, I have my ultra running, I have um, you know, my mindfulness practice, I have a bunch of different tools, and I will go use each of those different tools depending on the type of reflection that I need. Um, it, sometimes it's as simple as asking those three que questions as a retrospective with the team around what's working, what's not working, have we got any questions? Sometimes it really is that simple. Um, and sometimes you need a different tool. So I would encourage you to go and find a series of reflection tools for your toolbox. And uh, yeah, find a number of different things that might give you opportunities to reflect in different ways, um, that might give you different outcomes depending on where your head's at on a particular day of the week. Um, go and fill your toolbox with a bunch of active reflection tools and use them. Use them at different points. Um, continue to evolve. Work on, you know, whether it's journaling, whether it's sitting quietly, um, use those tools to help enhance the critical the critical pieces that you create that space. The tool that you choose to put into that space is going to differ from one person to another. But critically, you must be creating that space for active reflection. So that's what I wanted to share this week. Um, if you've got any thoughts or suggestions, if you want to share a tool that you use, um, you know, I've mentioned a few, gratitude journals, uh, mindfulness practice, meditation, um, yoga, physical exercise, um, you know, if you've got a tool that you use and you want to drop a note, um, please do. I would love to see what you use as a reflection tool um, because we can all do with adding different things to our toolkit, right? Um, and yeah, I hope wherever you are in the world, you're having an awesome, awesome week. I will see you again next week for the last capability in our seven series set, um, and that is community building. So I'll see you again next week.